Uh, okay, so I want to start by giving you guys a chance to ask any questions that you have about the midterm exam. Everybody got my email yesterday, right? And so the, you know, the exam has been on the syllabus there from the beginning. The thing that I want to stress most right, is that you're not coming here to take it, right? Um, I feel like it's better if we're not like passing papers back and forth. So you are going to take it online. It will open up at, it will open up on um, Thursday morning. You will have all day to take it. But remember that once you open it, you only have 75 minutes, right? And you cannot pause it. The exam will be open book, right? You can use your book. But be careful with an open book exam, right? It sounds like that makes it easier. But if you spend too much time leafing through your book, what happens? Exactly, yeah, you, you, you end up wasting time, right? So make sure that you are prepared and that you have passages that you think might be useful to you marked, right? So one thing that you're going to want to do is look at those sample questions that I posted on GeorgiaView, right? They're in the assignments folder. And be prepared to answer maybe two of those questions using a couple of different texts, right? Because the, the actual questions of the exam will ask you about specific texts, right? The ones on the sample are just kind of general, but those are the themes I want you to be, to be aware of and talking about, right? So think about texts that can fit those particular themes and how you might talk about them. And if you can think of a couple of those, and isolate a couple of passages where you think, okay, like this is something I might be able to use on the exam, right? Then you'll be pretty well prepared. Now the other thing uh, that you're gonna have to be prepared for is these identification questions, right? So let me just explain again briefly how that's gonna work, right? So you're gonna have 12 terms, and you're gonna pick eight of them, right? You don't get more credit for choosing more terms. I'm only gonna grade the first eight that you do. Um, and what you're going to give me is the name of a relevant text, right? There might be more than one relevant text. So you only have to give me one. The author of that text. And a brief but substantial definition, right? So what I mean by substantial is, right, that you tell me what it is and why it's important. should be giving me is like, a, sh like a, a short paragraph for each of these, right? That's what I'm looking for. And in terms of what kinds of terms I'm going to be asking you to identify, right? Some of them might be characters uh, from text we've read, right? I might ask you to tell me who Porfiro is, right? Or who the Beadsman is. Or to tell me about uh, the Leech Gatherer, right? to tell me about uh, the albatross or the wedding guest. Some of them might be places, um, and some of them might be conceptual terms, right? So I might ask you to define something like, say, define for me male and female Gothic, or horror and terror Gothic, right? I might ask you to define the greater romantic lyric, right? I might ask you, um, to define defamiliarization, things like that, right? I am not going to put anything on the exam that we didn't explicitly talk about in class, so if you have been showing up and taking notes, you should have all the information you need, right? Probably what the best thing to do to prepare for the IDs would be is to go through your notes 
and through the things we've already read. Isolate the names of important characters and important concepts. Write the term on one side of, of a note card, and then write the rest of the information, the text, the author's name, and the definition on the other side, right? And just sort of practice with, essentially make yourself flashcards to practice with, right? That's, that past students have found tends to be the most effective way to study for that part of the exam. So does anybody have any questions? Yeah, Valencia. So you say it's gonna be open-ended questions. There's gonna be like uh, 750 or short essay right? Yeah, so that's gonna be part, that's gonna be the first part of the exam, right? So how many articles are there? You're gonna have three to choose from, right? So I've given you four sample questions. And that's why I told you to be prepared to answer two of those, right? Because one of the ones you prepare to answer might not actually show up on the exam. But this at least gives you some sense of what kinds of themes I think are important in the course and what kinds of themes I think you should be focused on for the exam, right? Other questions? Anything else about the exam? Everybody's clear? Everybody gets it? Okay, and remember too, like you know, you have a good 75 minute chunk in the middle of the day to take this, right? Because you won't actually have to come here. So you said we just pick one of those questions? Yeah, um, for, the, for the essay questions, you're gonna pick one of three, right? That's gonna be worth 60 points, so slightly more than half. For the IDs, you're gonna pick eight out of 12. Those are going to be worth five points each. So the essay is worth more points. So it's often tempting to focus a lot of your energy on that. But remember that you know if you focus if you spend too long on the essay, then you're losing points because you don't have time to finish the IDs, right? So Sometimes the students will do some of the, will do at least some of the IDs first to make sure that you're, that you're not missing out on those points, right? And you know, I, I tell you this because I, you know I want everybody to do well, right? I want you guys to score well on the exam. I don't want people to fail. All right. Other questions about the exam. Okay, great. Then let's talk about King Arthur. So how familiar are you guys already with the figure of King Arthur? What do you know about King Arthur? that interpretation come from? Um, when he's like, he was Uh-huh. Okay, so that's the impression you got from this, which is actually not the impression it's trying to convey, so we'll try to work through that as we talk about this. But like, what if, like, I'm talking, like, not even about King Arthur, for, like, do you guys, I, I noticed a dead silence when I mentioned you, what you guys already know about King Arthur. Are you guys just not familiar? With this figure? His you name's not familiar, that's why I don't. Okay. All right, so I guess we got a lot of building up work to do here. Great. Okay, so King Arthur is a figure in kind of British national mythology, right? Um, so none of you have ever seen the Sword in the Stone. None of you are familiar with the idea of King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table. Like, none of this rings a bell. Okay. Okay, all right. Um, so, <clears throat> Arthur is this kind of historically malleable figure, right? Um, there have been various attempts to prove that he was a real person, um, but 
in all likelihood, he is either pure myth or a composite of other historical figures, right? So the real, the closest we can get to the real historical King Arthur is that there may have been a Romanized Celtic warlord of the 5th century who fought off an Anglo-Saxon invasion. Right. Most of the early texts that mention Arthur, mention him fighting off a big Saxon army that comes to Britain um, intending to settle and take over, right? And Arthur is a native Celt who was adopted Roman ways and uses Roman tactics to defeat them. The problem with this is that, so he's, the years that are given for him are roughly 450 to 475. But the name Arthur is not mentioned in any written records prior to the year 600. So this makes any attempts at pinning down a real historical figure with this name and these characteristics kind of difficult, right? He doesn't appear in the historical record until at least 150 years after he's supposed to have lived. So <clears throat> Arthur is not a big deal in English literature until the late medieval period. And part of this has to do with this whole Celtic warlord fighting Anglo-Saxons thing. Who are the ancestors of the modern English? Primarily Celts or primarily Anglo-Saxons? Does anybody know? Think about the words here. Celts, Anglo, Yes, exactly. The Anglo-Saxons are the ancestors, or at least the reputed ancestors, of the modern English. Although it's really more complicated than that. But for the sake of simplification, we'll say that this is what we'll say, right? So, because Arthur was the enemy of their ancestors, Anglo-Saxon kings of the medieval period don't elevate this figure to the status of mythic hero, right? Rather, he ends up becoming the central figure In romances by French and German writers. So this is a figure that largely moves across the English Channel into Europe and gets picked up there. And Arthur uh, quickly evolves in French and German literature from a warrior hero to instead a figure around whom other more important heroes are gathered. So most of the French romances, for example, don't really feature Arthur doing much of anything. Right? He sits at his court and his knights 
uh, Sir Lancelot, Sir Gawain, Sir Galahad, um, Sir, uh, <coughs> Sir Geraint, right, go off and perform, you know, deeds, perform quests, and then come back and are rewarded, right? So the knights become really the more important figures, um, and there's no central narrative. in most of these tales, right? They're just a collection of independent stories about different knights who happen to be located at Arthur's court. Now this changes in the 13th and 14th centuries. As French writers introduce The idea of the Grail Quest as a kind of organizing principle for all of this disparate Arthurian material, right? So they, you know, give these knights a unifying purpose, right? This object that they're all going off in quest of, all of these knights that appeared in these independent romances before this. the Arthur stories to ideas of spirituality and of medieval chivalry as well. All right, we'll talk a little bit about what chivalry means um, in a moment. And what starts happening, right, is that these Saxon kings who had resisted the Arthur legend fall out of power in England in 1066. France called the Normans become the new aristocracy in England, right? They kick all the old Saxon aristocrats um, to the curb and they take over. And they bring a lot of these French romances eventually into England, right? They bring the figure of Arthur back into favor in England. And so we start seeing all of these different Arthurian objects popping up. And there are these places that are associated with the Arthur myth that are intended to prove its historical veracity. So I'm going to show you some of these locations. is Tintagel Castle in Cornwall, or what's left of it. Reputedly, the birthplace of Arthur, right? His father, Uther, goes to war against another, the, the Duke of Cornwall because he wants the Duke of Cornwall's wife. And during the battle, somehow manages to sneak in to the castle in the guise of the Duke, seduce the Duke's wife, get her pregnant, and then go back. And then, of course, he eventually wins the war, and um, Arthur is born, and his, leg his, his legitimate son and all that, right, according to the regular myth. Uh, Tennyson's version is a little different. We'll get to that when we get to it. Uh, but okay, so we've got, here, we've got a birthplace, right? And a place of conception. Now this is Arthur's grave. Glastonbury. Right, on this site, near an old monastery, the bones of an enormous man and a woman were supposedly unearthed at some point in the Middle Ages with an inscription that named them as Arthur and Guinevere. 
So hey, we've got a grave, right? And here, we have a round table with Arthur given his place at the top, or at least what is supposedly there. It's a round table. The whole point of a round table is that everybody's supposed to be equal. And the names of all of his most important knights painted around the edges, right? Each in their place. What's that? This is like the wheel. I know it's a type of the wheel, like a painted wheel. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, it is supposed to, like, it's hanging on a wall. Yeah, that That's why it looks like a wheel, right? Yeah, um, but yeah, so this is referred to as the Winchester Round Table, right, because it hangs currently in Winchester Castle. So <clears throat> the problem with all of these proofs of Arthur's historicity, right, is that they're all based on late interpretations of the Arthur legend, right? They're all based on medieval stories, and some of them are obvious forgeries, right? So, for example, in the center of this round table is the rose that's the emblem of the Tudor family that ruled England in the late 15th through the early 17th centuries and was simply t trying to tie themselves into the legend, right? They wanted people to associate their family emblem with power and with English history and with the revival of Arthur, the once and future king, right? The king who will come again. In fact, Henry VII, the first king of the Tudor dynasty, actually named his older son Arthur, thinking he would come to the throne as King Arthur. It turns out that Arthur Tudor was uh, sickly and died, in, died in his youth and did not come to the throne. His brother, Henry VIII, um, came to the throne instead. So this is a forgery. Arthur's grave it was completely unknown before some Norman nobleman suddenly knew where to look, right, where to go digging in Glastonbury. And the inscription was in a form of Latin that wouldn't have been appropriate for the time when Arthur supposedly lived, right? So this is also a forgery. And Tintagel Castle, the birthplace, who knows, right? But the castle itself, the castle that stands anyway on that point, um, is also not old enough to have been the birthplace of the historical law, Arthur, right? So we have all of these attempts to try to prove the historical veracity of this particular figure, right? And he keeps coming back into English literature in a variety of different periods. So, for example, in 1485, a knight by the name of Thomas Mallory translates all of this French material, puts it into a coherent narrative, or tries to, and publishes it as Le Mort d'Arthur, or The Death of Arthur. This is the primary basis for Tennyson's poems. His cycle of poems is based mostly on Mallory, with some um, significant changes in the narrative. Uh, for example, in Mallory's narrative, Mordred, the villain, is actually Arthur's illegitimate son. In Tennyson's narrative, largely due to different Victorian values, uh, Mordred is instead simply Arthur's nephew, with no closer familiar and no stain of illegitimacy, right? So, 
When Tennyson is writing in the mid-19th century, he's writing in the midst of a big medieval revival. response to the Industrial Revolution, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail next week. But to give you um, a basic uh, overview here, right? So when the steam engine is invented at the end of the 18th century, it essentially revolutionizes European life, right? Um, a lot of things that had to be produced by hand could then be made by machines and factories. Steamships could cross the ocean much more quickly and much more safely than wooden sailing ships could. Um, locomotives begin crisscrossing Europe generally, right? And so people can travel from place to place both more quickly and with more safety from uh, bandits. So <clears throat> the pace of life is increasing. The availability of certain consumer goods increases. Um, and with it comes sort of paradoxically a kind of nostalgia for many of the values of medieval life, which gets then kind of caught up with some of uh, Carlyle's ideas about work. So we're going to see some of those Carlylean ideas exercised in the figure of Arthur in these two poems. Um, but uh, let's talk a little bit about the medievalist background for this as well, right? What Victor Victorian medievalism looked like. So this is a movement in architecture. In art and literature. And also in social behavior. Particularly for middle class men. Right, the idea of chivalry is resurrected in the 1820s among middle class men and becomes a kind of popular social organizing principle. In fact, a lot of the ideas that we're going to talk about about uh, women's place in society in the next couple of weeks um, are built on these, idea, these ideas of male chivalry. So we'll start with architecture here. So <clears throat> in the 1830s, an architect by the name of A.W.N. Pugin publishes a book called Contrasts. And what it is is a series of image plates in which he compares a medieval building with a modern building. The idea being that the medieval building is typically better than the modern building. Right. He's trying to make an argument for a return to medieval methods of construction and ornamentation, right? particularly medieval methods of design. So these are a couple of pages from Pugin's book. So here we have provisions for the poor in a, in a given community. right? On the top, we have a fully enclosed, circular, modern workhouse, right, where those who have no means of supporting themselves 
uh, can go and do mostly kind of meaningless menial work and be supported by the state there, right? Below, we have a medieval monastery with an open courtyard where people can come and go as they please. Um, and it looks almost more like a sort of like a, like a small community or town, right? The idea being that this is a kind of more commodious um, site for human flourishing and development. And here we have two market crosses, right? So market crosses, um, we have, I think we talked a little bit about this when we talked about the Eo St. Agnes, right? So these were the sites in medieval towns where the market gathered, right, uh, weekly. This is a modern market cross in London. And this is a much more ornate and majestic medieval example, right? In fact, I think you've already seen a picture of this. Again, we talked about the Eve of St. Agnes. That Chichester Market Cross was one of the things that inspired Keats to write that poem, right? The medieval architecture of Chichester generally. And this is also a big influence on Pugin and on his generation of architects. And so they want to use Victorian building techniques, like modern building techniques, to produce buildings that look medieval. So, for example, Westminster Palace, where Parliament meets, uh, was rebuilt and redesigned uh, over a period of 30 years from 1840 to 1870. Um, this design was done by an architect named Charles Barry, and Barry's design uh, combines features of medieval cathedral with medieval castle. Where is this at? This is in London. This is uh, Westminster Palace, where Parliament meets. That's not about the rules. I don't know why mm -hmm. And this is what the chambers inside Westminster Palace look like, right? They're designed by Pugin to look almost like the inside of a medieval cathedral, right? but much more kind of like richly decorated and, you know, with, with you know, these fancy leather seats and all that. We have these um, stained glass casement windows, right? This looks almost like an altarpiece up here, right? So this site, that, like, so this, this site of civic religion rather than spiritual religion, right? And this actually makes for a good segue into art in the queen's robing room, right, essentially where, where the queen gets dressed to go dress parliament, there's a series of paintings by William Dice on Arthurian themes, right? So each, each of these paintings features an episode from Arthurian legend. So here we have the knights finding the Holy Grail, for example, which represents piety. And each of these is supposed to represent one of the key Victorian virtues, right? So they're connecting directly episodes in the Arthurian legend to Victorian social virtues. And Tennyson is writing this poem at kind of the height of this medieval mania, which lasts for several decades. In fact, he's working on this poem from about 1833 to 1888. So this cycle of poems takes over 50 years for Tennyson to finish. Right, over half of his long lifetime. And the earliest part what of this, that, what's that? What does that say again? Where, what does what say? It's Tennyson, what is it called again? The Idols of the King. So I-D-Y-L-L, -L, idol, 
Um, I'm going to guess that probably none of you know what that word means, right? Okay, so an idol is a poem of memory and rural retreat. So the first idols were written by a Greek poet named Theocritus, uh, <clears throat> who was at the court of the Ptolemies in Alexandria. And Theocritus wrote these poems about shepherds on his home island in the Mediterranean, it's called Kos. And what we have is an educated court poet writing these kinds of escapist fantasies um, about rural shepherds, right? And that provides the model for idols in the future. So when we talk about idols, we're, always, we're usually talking about poetry that is in some sense escapist, right? It's a kind of um, territory that is cordoned off from, insulated from, uh, the more unpleasant features of reality. But I think one of the interesting things about this cycle and the fact that these poems are referred to as idols is that Tennyson actually starts with the end. The first poem in this cycle that he writes is what will become the passing of Arthur. Right? He writes the first draft of that in 1833 and is finished with it by 1842. The companion poem that's printed here, The Coming of Arthur, isn't published until the 1860s, right? Almost so 20 years later. And then, of course, when all the poems are completed, they are bound together as a single book in the late 1880s. But yeah, so they kind of appear piecemeal over a number of years and then are collected into a single cycle, right? And the cycle starts at least imaginatively, with Arthur's death. So the vision of society that's put forth here is one that its author regards as doomed to fail from the beginning. Right, the central fact that around which all of the poems are organized is the eventual death of the hero and his removal from the world. So let's have a look at how the poems themselves operate. How do these poems go for you? What did you think of them? Okay, well, there is narrative here, right? These are narrative poems, so these are both telling a story. If we, look, if we look at the coming of Arthur, how many of you were able to figure out what is happening in the poem? I felt like at some, at different points in time, I knew what was going on, and then like, as it continued on, I kind of lost it. I mean, like, that's how it was. Okay, so what were you able to figure out was going on? Before, I think when Arthur was about to become king, at first they didn't want him to become king, if I'm correct. Or was okay, yeah, so that, that is part of this, right? So there's resistance to Arthur becoming king, right? Yeah, something like that. Okay. Yeah, so one of the things that he's involved in doing in this poem is defeating in battle those kings and princes in Britain who have defied him, right? What else is going on in this poem? It sounds like he was about to battle someone at some point in time, or maybe they, or maybe the people around him was about to battle somebody at one point in time. Okay, yeah, so he, he does manage to bring everybody who was resisting him under his thumb, right? So he does manage to bring all the rebellious lords to heal. And then what else?
What what is the basis of these lords' resistance to Arthur? What are they not convinced of? I think they said something like he wasn't somebody. Yeah, he wasn't born to somebody. Someone. Yeah, there's there are questions about his origins, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. They say he only has the right to rule if he really is the previous king, Uther's son, right? And so we have a couple of different stories told by different people of what Arthur's origins are, right? Some of which suggest that he is Uther's son. Another of which seems to suggest that he's kind of dropped there almost by fairies or aliens or something, right? Yeah, like these, he didn't belong. Yeah, these people show up on a ship and drop off a baby, and Merlin picks the baby up and says, here's an heir for Uther, and there we go, right? Now, we'll talk about which version of, the, of, of events is confirmed in the final poem, right? we get confirmation of Arthur's actual identity there. Um, but um, what else is that? Like, what does Arthur want here? What does Arthur want in this poem? What's the thing that he's trying to get? For everyone to get along? There's something specific that he wants for himself. What is he trying to convince this King Leodegrance to do? And it's maybe a little bit confusing because Arthur himself doesn't come to do it. He sends emissaries to do it. What does he want this King Leodegrance to give him? I'll give you a hint. Look at the first few lines of the poem on page 223. Leodegrand, the King of Cameliard, had one fair daughter and none other child. And she was fairest of all flesh on earth, Guinevere, and in her his one delight. He her? Yeah. He's, yeah, he's trying to convince the king to give him his daughter in marriage, right? This other king, whom he's rescued. That's why he sends these emissaries to King Leodegran, right? He sends his two best knights, and then he sends his sister, right? And they tell these different stories of Arthur's origins to try to allay <coughs> Leodegran's worries about Arthur and who he really is, right? So let's look at the way the poem describes the state of Britain at the time Arthur shows up. Can I get somebody to start reading on page 223, um, starting at line five. For many a pity king, here Arthur came. For many a pity king, here Arthur came, ruled in his eyes and every way he ruled. Each upon Arthur wasted all the land, still from time to time the heathen host sworn overseas and carried what was left. And there grew great tax of wilderness, wherein the beast was ever more and more, but man was less and less to Arthur came. But for Aurelius lived and fought and died, and after him King Uther fought and died, but ever failed to make the king one. And after these, King Arthur for a space and and throw the puissance. Puissance of his ta of his table round drew all the pretty prince. Okay, you can stop there, right? So before Arthur shows up, what's Britain like? What's going on here? Divided. Divided. Yeah, divided, right? And what are the results of this division? Right, so we've got a, um, you know, a nation that is essentially broken up into civil war, right? We've got all these petty princedoms battling each other. And what's the result of that? 
Yeah, okay, yeah, the, the past kings weren't able to hold it together, right? Aurelius couldn't hold it together. Uther couldn't hold the kingdom together, right? They have to deal with invaders from time to time, right? So, ever waging war each upon other, wasted all the land, and still from time to time the heathen hosts swarmed overseas and harried what was left, right? So there's no defense from invaders because they can't, get, they can't cooperate. And the word waste is important here as well. Right? We see this pop up a lot, right? What does waste mean when, we talk about, when we're talking about, like, when we're talking about land? What is wasteland? something that doesn't matter or that Okay, yeah, I think you're thinking along the right tracks, right? So, you know, you know, people don't live there. People don't farm it, right? It's land that doesn't produce anything. So waste is unproductive land. So before Arthur comes, The general state of the nation is all-out war with no coordinated defense, no cooperation, and the kingdom is laid waste, right? The whole kingdom is basically wasteland. It's unproductive land. So there's no kind of, me there's no meaningful work happening here. There's no meaningful industry, right? And then Arthur comes. And thus the land of Cameliard was waste, thick with wet woods, and many a beast therein, and none or few to scare or chase the beast. So that wild dog and wolf and boar and bear came night and day and rooted in the fields and wallowed in the gardens of the king. And ever and anon the wolf would steal the children and devour. But now and then her own brood lost her dead, lent her fierce teeth to human sucklings. And the children, housed in her foul den, there at their meat would growl, and mocked their foster mother on four feet till straightened, they grew up to wolf-like men worse than the wolves. And King Leodegran groaned for the Roman legions here again, and Caesar's eagle. Then his brother King Urien assailed him. Last a heathen horde, reddening the sun with a smoke and earth with blood, and the spike that split the mother's heart spitting the child break on him, till amazed he knew not whether he, whether he should turn for aid. So King Leodegran is besieged, right? by another king, and by a heathen army. The word heathen is actually kind of important here. From overseas. Now, when we use the word heathen, what does this usually mean? What's a heathen? Something that, I don't know how to say, like a savage? I don't know. Yeah, we, we, we tend to regard a he, yeah, heathen, heathenism as... Yeah, it's a word that was often attached to cultures that European colonists regarded as savage or primitive, right? That's why I put those words in quotes. Specifically, heathen tends to refer to religious belief. Heathen is a not particularly nice term for non-Christians. Right, those who do not follow what the 19th century, century missionaries regarded as the true religion, right? And yeah, it has those associations with primitivism and with savagery and with uh, being uncivilized, right? So we're, we're, we're meant to think here not just of a horde of primitive people, but of primitive people who have the wrong belief system, right? Now, what else do we notice about, like, so the previous stanza talked about the land and the kings, right? What, what are the people of Britain like at this time, according to this stanza? Are they more like human beings or like beasts? Yeah. That in this lawless state, right, in this anarchic state, the people are like beasts,
And King Leodogram is wishing for some, uh, <clears throat> you know, some outside force like the Roman Empire, right, to come in and impose order again. And that's where Arthur comes in. But, for he heard of Arthur newly crowned, though not without an uproar made by those who cried, he is not Uther's son. The king sent to him, saying, Arise and help us thou, for here between the man and beast we die. And Arthur, had, and Arthur yet had done no deed of arms, but heard the call and came. And Guinevere stood by the castle walls to watch him pass. But since he neither wore on helm nor shield the golden symbol of his kinglyhood, but rode a simple knight among his knights, and many of these in richer arms than he, she saw him not, or marked not if she saw, one among many, though his face was bare. But Arthur, looking downward as he passed, felt the light of her eyes into his life, smite on the sudden, yet rode on and pitched his tents beside the forest. Then he drave the heathen, after slew the beast, and fell the forest, letting in the sun, and made broad pathways for the hunter and the knight, and so returned. So let's start with the end of the stanza. What does Arthur do with all of this wasteland? What is the, what, what's the effect of his military victory here? He wants to gather it or do something with it now? Yes, it, it, specific, specifically how this. So he fells the forest, letting in the sun, and made broad pathways for the hunter and the knight. So through war, he's making this land productive again. Right? Yeah. He's making the land safe and productive. So let him, um, let him Yeah, basically. <laughs> So yeah, yeah it, it, it's, 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 not, it's not nice work, right? But yeah, like the, the, the point is, is that like he is, through his efforts, right, he is bringing order back to the land, right? Now what about the description of Arthur at the beginning of this thing? So what's weird about it if we're talking about a king? Can he be distinguished from his knights in any way? Mm, he so. have no armor. Well, he's got armor, right? His face is bare, but he wore. But he neither wore on helm nor shield the golden symbol of his kinglyhood, but rode a simple knight among his knights. So does he stand out, or does he just blend into the crowd? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he looks like any other knight. Here. He is not elevating himself above the others. So there's a, a weird kind of a, like almost quasi-democratic element to this, right? He's making a point of not standing out. And again, what is the other king's complaint about him? Why, why do they not want him on the throne? What's this question about him? Yeah, they say he is not Uther's son, right? Now, why does this matter? What does this suggest their idea of kingship is based on? Is their idea of kingship based on who can best do the work? Yeah, what is it based on instead? Um, who's more uh, who's like, yeah, it's more well known. Yeah. yeah, well, if it's just pure inheritance, right? If your father was king, you get to be king too, right? At least as long as you don't have any older brothers. So, yeah, this is the old system called primogeniture, right? In which the oldest son. inherits the father's whole estate and title, right? And this is the way the old aristocracy worked, right? But Arthur 
is operating here by a different principle, right? He blends in with his knights, and he <clears throat> becomes king mostly by proving his worth through work, right? So <clears throat> what we have here seems almost like an argument for meritocracy. Right? Let the guy who's good at it and is willing to put in the labor do it. Um, and then if we look on page 225, as he notices Guinevere, right? And Arthur, passing thence to battle, felt travail and throes and agonies of the life desiring to be joined with Guinevere. And thinking as he rode, her father said that there between the man and beast they die. Shall I not lift her from this land of beasts up to my throne and side by side with me? What happiness to reign a lonely king vexed, O oh, ye stars that shudder over me, O oh, earth that soundest hollow under me, vexed with waste dreams. For saving I be joined to her that is the fairest under heaven. I seem as nothing in the mighty world, and I cannot will my will, nor work my work wholly, nor make myself in mine own realm victor and lord. But were I joined with her, then might we live together as one life, and reigning with one will in everything, have power on this dark land to lighten it, and power on this dead world to make it live. So what's weird about this is a declaration of love. What does it seem he actually wants Guinevere for here? Yeah, he doesn't so much want a wife as he wants a kind of co-worker, right? A kind of helpmate. Now this is on the one hand very typically Victorian. Right? Victorian society divided men and women up into separate spheres. Essentially, the man that managed all affairs of the family outside the house was the public face of the family. And the woman was intended to manage the household, right? So the man's sphere is public, right? You know, going out and felling trees and hunting wolves and making the world safe for whatever he's making the world safe for. While Guinevere is to manage the household, the castle, the domestic servants, all that sort of thing, right? And these were regarded, at, at least theoretically, these were regarded as being kind of, of equal dignity and equally necessary. But in practice, uh, the man's work tended to be elevated over the woman's, right? And certainly, being the one who operated in public, the man had more freedom than the, women, than the woman did. So we have a very Victorian idea of marriage here. But the other thing that's weird about it is kind of how well it, it accords with Carlyle and his gospel of work and his great man theory. Because one thing that we see here is that Arthur really is kind of a missionary for an idea, right? Like Carlyle's idea, like Carlyle's notion of the great man. That Arthur is one of these people who promotes an idea of society or an idea of civilization through hard work. And Guinevere is useful to him in that she can help him with this, right? She can do the other half of the work. Well, Guinevere was a lady? Guinevere, yes, Guinevere is, Guinevere is a woman. Yes, she is Leo de Grand's daughter. Oh. <laughs> I thought it was a, I thought it was a man. Uh, nope. It was, yeah. Wasn't it someone else in the story that had a name just like her? I can't remember the name. It was someone else that had a name just like yeah, her. Yeah, Arthur's nephew is Gawain. 
Gawain, G A W A I N, that might be. It, it's, a, it, it's something, it was another name that had like beer at the end. Bedivere is, okay. That is, yeah, that is Bede, that Bedivere is the knight who is still with Arthur at the end, right? So that, is, that was the man. That might be who you're thinking of, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is the basic idea of Arthur that's built up in this first poem, right? As this sort of Carlylean great man doing this labor to uh, civilize an uncivilized world. Um, <clears throat> what else is weird about the way he woos Guinevere in this poem? Do the two of them ever actually speak to each other before they're married? No. And he does all of the wooing through emissaries, right? He sends other people to do it for him. And she's not really involved here either. Her father makes the decision. So all of this goes back, all this back and forth is between people other than the two people in the couple, right? And I think like this is related to the dream that Leodegrand has about a phantom king. Right? In a lot of ways, Arthur is more of an idea than a person. He's an idea that describes a particular vision of civilization, which in a lot of ways is pretty close to the way he was depicted in these old romances, right? Arthur's not the central figure in those. He's the thing that holds it all together. Right? He's the common element in all those stories. They're all centered around his court. But he himself isn't really involved in the action. Now, let's look, just before we finish up here, at the second poem, at the passing of Arthur. And in particular, the end of it. What happens at the end of the passing of Arthur? Once Bedivere has managed to throw the sword back into the water, what becomes of Arthur? What happens to him? If we go to page 242, then saw they how there hove a dusky barge, dark as a funeral scarf from stem to stern, beneath them and descending they were aware that all the decks were dense with stately forms, black stoled, black hooded like a dream. By these three, crown, three queens with crowns of gold, and from them rose a cry that shivered to the tingling stars, and as it were one voice in agony of lamentation, like a wind that shrills all night in a wasteland where no one comes or hath come since the making of the world. So according to that one story of Arthur's origin and the coming of Arthur, how did Arthur come into the world? Yeah, how did he come into the world in the story that's told about uh, you know Merlin finding the baby? Yeah, yeah this ship with these weird golden-haired people shows up, drops off a naked baby, right, and then leaves, right? So what's happening now at the end of Arthur's life? Yeah, his people come back to get him, right? So what we have here is this kind of confirmation of Arthur's identity as this kind of alien or fairy being, right? So it doesn't matter that he wasn't Uther's son, right? It doesn't matter that he wasn't part of this particular one. He has this, this other special origin, right? Yeah, it's like they dropped him off maybe to do a specific job. When they knew the job was done, they yes. came back. 
yet. They drop him off at the beginning of his life and pick him back up at the end, right? And if we look at the state of the world in the passing of Arthur, right? Now, we, just, we don't have too much time for this, um, so I just kind of want to um, quickly note the kinds of imagery that we see here. You see things like broken chapels, tombs, the battle takes place on a wasteland again, right? The king's marriage is broken, his knights have rebelled against him. So what's the state of the world at the end of Arthur's reign? It kind of went back like how it was before he got there. Yeah, it's reverted back to the state at the beginning of his journey, right? So the basic idea here being that the world seems to, like society seems to operate in these natural cycles, right? That these great men can only hold back for so long, if at all, right? That nobody's work lasts forever. That everything that we make eventually breaks apart and decays. So it's a pretty bleak message overall, right? That if Arthur coming in in this shining blaze of glory and putting everything to rights, but even he can't hold it together, right? It all comes apart anyway. And I think this is important, especially when we think about the fact that the passing of Arthur is the first part of the poem to be written, right? So the entire cycle of poems is written with this ending in mind, right? That everything is going to go back to entropy. Everything's going to go back to chaos, right? And I think that this speaks to the Victorian mindset as well, right? If we look at Britain in the Victorian period, right, the British Empire is at its largest. Britain is at the peak of its wealth and power. And even in the 1830s, uh, you know, when you're, in the, you're say like 1842, maybe like, you know, when Tennyson first publishes this poem after he's gone through several drafts, um, it's already becoming clear to some people that this is not sustainable, right? That this cannot last. That eventually this is all going to come crashing down on us. And I think that's what this poem ultimately gives us a vision of, right? These idols, remember, idols are these you know, fantasies in protected spaces. But eventually, those walls come down. And whatever they were protecting you from comes in to destroy the fantasy. All right, so that is all I have for you. Now, just to note, the exam isn't going to cover uh, Tennyson to give you some more time to absorb this, right? So the exam is going to cover everything up to Carlisle. That's the last thing the exam is going to cover. Would like that last story we read, I forgot what the name was. Sartor Sartus? Yeah. Yeah, that's the last thing that's going to be on the exam. Okay, I have a question. I remember at, in the instructions, you said something about like um, when you when you were writing about something, you were saying we was gonna have to name like a certain places, characters, something like that. Yeah, the second half. Um, I went. I, I did go over this at the beginning of class. Um, the second half of the exam is gonna be identification terms. Mm -hmm. So characters, concepts, places from the things that we've read. Um, you're going to give me the relevant text, the name of the relevant text, the name of the author of that text, and a brief definition that explains what the thing is and why it's important. Like, what's the meaning behind the story you mean? You're just going to tell me what the term means. Oh, you're saying the term you give us the word. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you 12 identification terms. You're going to choose eight to define. Okay, any other questions before I let you go? All right.
go, go forth. I will see you uh, next Tuesday. Oh yes, that's right. <laughs> responsibility.